For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating tonight? Tonight, we are celebrating Jerry Herman. Now, we lost Jerry just before COVID, but we didn't exactly lose him because his music, we hear it every single day. If you listen, it's there. And tonight, we're going to be celebrating his life, his legacy, and his body of worth. And I have some very special guests waiting in the wings. But tonight, we're going to start, as all of his shows did, with an amazing overture. Now, the overture that we're going to start with tonight is not one of his most well-known overtures. This was for a concept album and a concept show that he did in Las Vegas called Miss Spectacular. And I'd like to thank Larry Blank for sending this to us. And it celebrates two great men, uh, Don Pippen and Jerry Herman. And you'll see them both in this clip. So thank you, Larry Blank. And here it is. Miss Spectacular. Yes, I will. <laughs>
Now that is an overture. And I am going to bring on his goddaughter, Jane. Jane, I am so thrilled that you are here tonight. Um, Jerry's music has been a part of my life, uh, my whole life. Uh, I made my debut on stage when I was 13 years old in MAME uh, in a community theater. And of course, Jerry's music has always been there. And of course, it's always been a part of your life. Yes, as a matter of fact, most of the songs were written either in his living room or my mother's living room. But I have to start, that overture was a kiss to me and I thank you. I don't know if you're aware, but the lead character in this spectacular is named Sarah Jane. My daughter is named Sarah and she is also his goddaughter. So when he wrote the lyric, I'll love you forever, my Sarah Jane, I can't even tell you, I was in tears. So thank you, thank you for opening with that glorious overture. Well, thank Larry Blank, who is celebrating a big birthday tonight. Yes, he is. And I, I do thank him. So, and that show has all sorts of treasures that we can get into at some other point. But yes, not only was his, was I literally, the only show that you're missing on your little board is Milk and Honey. And that's a huge, I mean, if you want to sort of start there, I think some of Jerry's most beautiful music and lyrics come from that show. I mean, when you look at Let's Not Waste a Moment or as simple as that, in some ways, I think Jerry was his freest because there was no rules or a rule book at that point in his career. He just literally wrote from the heart. Um, and, you know, his music just got a on one hand more sophisticated and clever. And on the other hand, he understood simplicity better than anyone. I mean, if you look at Dear World, I mean, some of those lyrics are about as raw as they get, kiss her now, and I was beautiful. I mean, that's really hard to do. So yes, Jerry's music has always been with me. He is a part of my heart. He's sort of the way I think. I can't imagine walking down the street or relating to a person without having one of Jerry's lyrics in, in my heart and in my mind. Well, Dear World is going to be done uh, as part of Encores this yes. season. Uh, it is truly one of my favorite musicals of Jerry's. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it's along with Mac and Mabel, uh, of course, there is no denying everyone considers Mac and Mabel one of his most glorious scores. Uh, the book, is, of course, is problematic. But the story itself is problematic. Yes, it is. And very hard to work backwards. You know, we all know what happens with, you know, in that story. So I think that was sort of working against it. But Dear World, talk about timely. I feel like we're going back to the future with Dear World. I mean, with, you know, the industrialists and the oil barons underneath the streets of Paris. And I'm so glad that they're, ha they're doing it again. From what I understand, there's a new script and I've always had so many unanswered questions about the characters, like what drove Countess Aurelia mad? Why did she go underground? And I hope someday somebody answers those questions for me. Will you be able, uh, coming to New York for this production? I am planning to be there. Well, maybe we'll do a, a, a live interview. I, I love that. that. And, we'll go, and we will go a little deeper into these stories and everything. Do you have a favorite moment uh, with Jerry, um, that is not a spotlight moment. Oh my gosh, I have so many, but I think the one that Jerry and I were attached in a way that very few people were. We always wound up at the same place at the same time. So when I was getting ready to deliver, my daughter, he winds up at Cedars with an infected finger at the same time. And we're sitting across from one another at the emergency room. I mean, it's just a series of stories like that. But another great story is, I mean, he was really like a father to me. So I believe I was in second grade and he had that fabulous townhouse down in the village. And do you remember when telephones had those really long extension cords? Yes. Well, I don't remember, I don't know how he got one, but this one was the, the length of a football field. So he was having a meeting with David Merrick. He answered the phone for me always. And he excused himself for the meeting 
took the phone with him into his bar. If anybody was at the townhouse, you would know that that bar that was off of the living room. He crouched down under the bar, took 15 minutes to help me with my homework, and then went back to his meeting. That sounds like, I, I, he called me, you know, I, on the 50th anniversary of Hello Dolly, I threw a brunch at Sardi's. And I got a phone call from Jerry the night before the brunch, uh, out of the blue, thanking me for taking the time to do this. Because he felt that it, it was the 50th anniversary of Hello Dolly. This was long before the Bette Midler production was being done. And Jerry felt that it was forgotten that year. Well, these properties are his children. Yes. And anyone who honors his children, I mean, come on, it's, it's why he does what he does. So, I mean, I can't imagine living in a world without a Jerry Herman musical, and it's very painful living without him right now. I'm just glad he didn't have to experience the scourge of COVID. Well, I would like to celebrate two of his children in this next clip, which will bring a third child on board with us, if, if you will just follow that logic. Yes. Uh, and uh, this clip will bring back a lot of memories for our next guest. Here it is. Thank you. 
So first of all, I want to say, uh, David Galligan, that yeah. was his idea, and I tried to reach him tonight. I and unfortunately, I was not able to get him. That was an evening called "Tap Your Troubles Away" uh, with the uh, Los Angeles, uh, or was it the San Francisco chorus of the Los Angeles? Chorus. Los Angeles. Los Angeles chorus. And Harlan, uh, you had already been working with Angela Lansbury, but that evening, everyone you could see the bedazzled uh, arm of Carol Channing. Uh, do you want to tell everyone what happened prior to the show that night? You, uh, um, you've got me bawling. Oh, that was the yeah. first. That was uh, Angela, Carol, and Jerry were three of my greatest cheerleaders, and that was the first time they all came together. So that was probably one of the most magical evenings, and uh, David Galligan and David Michaels both have to be cheered for that. Um, the rubies that uh, Angela was wearing were from I had gone and picked up from Harry Winston's, and the uh, rubies and diamonds, and the diamonds on her cast had come from Harry Winston's. They had to string a whole bunch of, of necklaces together to make to go around the cast. Uh, she had uh, she had missed a step. Back then, uh, they only had the during rehearsal. They had really very little lighting on. They had not marked the stairs yet. And then during one of the rehearsals, coming down the stairs, she stepped off instead. Not only missing a step, stepped off the side, and she she broke her arm dislocated her shoulder, cracked two ribs, fractured her thumb, stitches to her temple. And I had to rush her to the hospital. So many stories I won't go into just on that alone. But I remember they were wheeling her in. I was talking to David Galligan and David Michaels on the phone saying, here's what's happening. Here's where we're at. Here's what's going on. And they, over the speakerphone, they said, all right, well, we'll announce that Carol's not going to be appearing. And Carol from the background went, well, why on earth wouldn't I be there? <laughs> That became that became the press was that despite all of that happening, she still made the curtain. So yeah. it, it was um, it was a, it was a magical evening in in more ways than one. And you know that old the, the adage the show must go on. She lived it, she breathed it, and she experienced it always. And she never except for Kalamazoo, we know that story, uh, would never miss a performance. <laughs> half a performance, yeah. Yes, half a performance. Uh, but Harlan, you had the opportunity of, uh, because of this event and many other events, uh, working with Jerry. So you saw both the 
professional uh, Jerry Herman and the uh, offstage Jerry Herman. What are some of the life lessons that you learned from him that you've carried through uh, your entire life, uh, both as a publicist uh, and just in your day-to-day living? Um, well, one thing personally, uh, he gave me a lot of confidence in myself. Um, uh, there, uh, when I came in, when I first met him, I was very nervous. I mean, I was, I'd worked with a lot of big names and a lot of people, but I was still very uncomfortable in my own shoot, in my own skin uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, Jerry just had a confidence in me that uh, spilled over. And uh, he also taught me that um, I shouldn't take things so seriously. Um, you know, that uh, life was a musical for him. I mean, every, in everyday life, he had a song and something for everything. Um, and Eileen Graff teases me because every so often I'll perform for one of her shows or one of her salons or with her as a guest on her show. And I always seem to, she always, she always, she, we always walk in, she goes, gee, you chose a Jerry Herman song. What a shock. <laughs> Well, but his songs are all about optimism. It's right. about uh, the life experiences. I don't think his songs uh, will ever fade away. Um, no, Carol, uh, Carol had a great way of pointing that out. In whenever the country has been in its worst state, Dolly's come back, Mames come back. Those were the, the. If you look at history, every time every time the country has been in needed a lift, it's been a Jerry Herman musical that's done it. Well, yes. I, when when Hello Dolly opened, it opened. You know, the, it, you know the beginnings of the Vietnam War uh, was raging. I mean, the uh, Hello the, Dolly even the president had been assassinated after the Kennedy assassination. That allowed the country to start moving yeah. forward again. It, it, yeah. it was the first. It was the first musical that Jackie Jackie Kennedy went to see with the kids at a matinee. Well, I mean, just to go into the history of this, uh, they were booked uh, at the Fisher Theater in Detroit. Uh, they were opening on, the, they had their first preview on the 18th and the Kennedy assassination happened three days later. And they were all, uh, you know, Sandra Lee tells this story of them all sitting around this little transistor radio, hearing the news not knowing where they were, uh, their next stop was the National Theater in Washington, D.C. And the Kennedys, as you just pointed out, were scheduled to be there opening night. Uh, when Pearl Bailey was doing Dolly, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And she had to make a decision as to whether or not the company would even, even go on stage that night. Uh, and, you know, and it's, we, these songs, have kept the morale of the country up yeah. against the worst, you know, and then La Caja Fall opening just on the brink of the AIDS crisis hitting this country. Yes. No, it, it's true. His timing was extraordinary, but he also chose source material yeah. that's ubiquitous. And that was part, I mean, there were a lot of fabulous properties that he actually turned down. And I asked him once, I said, is there any property you regret not musicalizing? And he said, only one, Oliver. So, but he was very careful. So many things came his way. And he said, Jane, they just don't sing. Or he said, this is fleeting. And what I love about all of his musicals is you can reduce the spine of the show down to one or two words. Hello, Dolly is about second chances. Mame is about bigotry, fighting bigotry. La Caja Fall is about defining family. When I went back to the whole point about simplicity, that was Jerry's, in my opinion, one of Jerry's huge strengths. When you can synthesize what it is you're trying to convey into a couple of words, you know it's going to fly and live forever. And you're right, he is an optimist. He always was an optimist. And I was trying to think a little bit about this. And he was born in 1931. And this was on the eve of the Depression. So he was, you know, as a kid, he saw the worst of times emerge into the best of times. And I think he had an innate sense that tomorrow was going to be better. Just hang on. Plus, the man was so loved by his mother. 
And he actually had fun as a kid. There weren't these distractions of electronics. They sat around and played games. And the other thing too is, if you were gonna sum up one thing on the personal side, Jerry had the best sense of humor in the world. He was always laughing. The last time I saw him, I brought the game Crimes Against Humanities for us to play. He was spot on his game, even like three weeks before he passed away. The man had an extraordinary sense of humor, always. Jane, I wanna talk about his optimism uh, because I mean, we see and hear the optimism in his music uh, and in his shows. Uh, and if you know his history, and obviously you know his history better than any of us, uh, but he was like almost like the sparrow that was beating against the wind as well. Uh, when he got Hello Dolly, uh, when he arrived uh, in uh, Detroit, uh, David Merrick lost faith in the fact that he, uh, this young guy who was 23 years old, was he going to be able to carry a massive musical like this? And he was bringing people in to doctor the show, even though the show did not need the doctoring. Um, what kept Jerry going? What was... A couple, a couple of things. First of all, Jerry is not a quitter. Right. He may have been very diminutive physically, but you got to watch out for us little ones. We, we're, we're tough. Um, okay, that, that's number one. I have documentation. He was struggling in Detroit, and my parents said, Jerry, come home. This is not worth the stress. And in his letter to my parents, he said, no. He said, I'm going to the grocery store. I'm buying a, um, a gallon of milk and a whole bag of Hershey chocolate bars. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> okay, and he said, I'm going to do it. And that night at once, he wrote before the parade passes by and it completely changed the course of the show. But that's Jerry. And, um, you know, it was a kind of brilliance. I mean, for your audience who don't know, everyone says, well, does he write the music or lyrics first? And I asked him that question a million times. And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, I write them simultaneously. He, he, he said, Jane, he said, whatever is up here comes out in my fingers. And that was Jerry. He just needed, for Hello Dolly, it just all needed to make sense. So that, that was Jerry. And I mean, even when you started with Miss Spectacular, one or two of the songs in that show were cut from Mac and Mabel. So he was very efficient at using what I call trunk material. Right, he never threw anything away. Thank goodness, yeah. even from college. Harlan, getting to know him, what was the thing that surprised him the most, uh, surprised you the most about him? That, I mean, first of all, I look at Jerry Herman. To me, he's like a god in this business. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, you know, worship him and his music but you got to know him as a person beyond all of that. What surprised you the most about him as a person? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, uh, surprise is the wrong word for it. Um, how he adapted and to any situation that was coming in, how he communicated with people um, um, no matter what the situation, um, he seemed to have the, the set the correct tone for whatever was, um, going on, whether personal or whether it was work, um, he could, he could, um, he could, he could make everyone, even, even with an argument, cause I do remember arguments going on between people and he could, just just by being there but he would some it, he had something the right thing to say or he had he could shift i watched him shift conversations so that things got pleasant and the negative went away when when people were having arguments he just had a way of of um of stuff of redirecting the argument that was in process because i saw uh, arguments uh with directors with with talent everything he just had a way of um Peacemaker without, does that make sense, Jane? It does. First of all, he was really kind. Yeah. And the kindness 
combined with the intelligence, you really, when he opened his mouth, you really couldn't argue with him because he was, he nailed it. Yeah. And I think, and I think that was it. And also Jerry wasn't crazy. I mean, you can know how crazy some of these celebrities or personalities can be. And he just watches it and he, he doesn't engage, but when he needs to insert himself, he does. Also, if you are loved and, um, res re and respected by Jerry, there is no greater support. I mean, it just it literally, I feel it to this day. Harlan, I know how he felt about you. He loved you. And to be able to, to, I know I will carry that with me till the end of my days. And it, he, Jerry was unique. I mean, and he was also supportive. I mean, even when you look at his yeah. work that he did with, with um, college kids wanting to promote musical theater, the college, I mean, who, who does that? Not, not too many because he understands how important it is to keep the, um, the, the art of musical theater alive. And without young college kids learning about it, we won't have a musical theater 50 years from now. So again, he's like the Dolly Levi hits, he puts his finger in or his hand in. So um, it's, it's wonderful. I, uh, both both Carol and Jerry used to say that for, uh, the arts are fertilizer fertilizer on the brain. Exactly. Yes. And, and yeah, it, it can help anyone in any field, no matter what field you're working in. So uh, true. Yeah. And 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 watching Jerry when Jerry walked into the room, again he was not a large man, but he commanded the room. And you can't do something like Jerry's Girls with that many talents that many in different egos and personalities and not be able to control the room. And he could. Absolutely. They, well, they shut up when he, when he, when, when, it, when he, when he spoke, no one else had anything to offer. He was the final word. God bless him. Leroy Reams was, a, was supposed to be here tonight and he had trouble getting on. So, <laughs> Leroy, I'm so sorry you couldn't be here, but and I do want to let everyone know that next Saturday night we've got a very special guest. Uh, Carol Cook is going to be here. Oh. So please tune in. Uh, and I spoke with Tom yesterday. I just hung up with Tom before this. That's funny. Oh, um, and uh, she's excited. I want to talk about our next guest. Um, she is actually uh, my sponsor for this week, and she has a new album out called Be Imagine. And when she reached out uh, to sponsor this week, and first of all, I'm going to bring her on as I talk about her. I love this album, but there's a track on the album of one of Jerry's songs. And I said I wanted to play it tonight uh, because to me, it's the song that sums up everything. I had a little trouble uh, downloading it, so I'm going to share it. Hold on a second. We're not... Uh, uh, I'm going to see if I can share the video. I'm trying something new this evening. <laughs> let's see if I can do this. And I think I can. And let's see this. Let's see if this works. And I think it will. Wow. Yeah. Hey, Before the parade passes by I got a 
want to go and taste Saturday's high life before the parade. I'm ready to move out in front. I've had enough of just passing by life with the rest of them, with the best of them. I'm gonna hold my head up high, for I've got a goal again. I've got a drive again. I'm gonna feel my heart come alive again before the Thank you. And she put that together this afternoon for us. I put that I put it in a, no, I put together. A, I put together a really, really cool video this afternoon, and it my computer crashed. I put that together in an hour. So it's, oh my gosh, it is what it is. <laughs> no, it's great, and I love this. And you, I mean, you performed this in your show. I love your show, and I'm thrilled that you're here tonight. What I mean, as a singer, I mean, singing these great Barry Herman songs, you know, what the, what's the experience like for you singing this particular song on stage? And yes. your show, of course, is Reimagine. Your album is Reimagine. And you're looking at this song through a different lens. Well, you know, all of the different songs on the album are reimagined with a different thought process. With this one, um, it was the first song when I jumped into Cabaret five years ago that Wendy Cabot, who was the music director of Come From Away, she and I uh, arranged. Um, and I was stepping back into being a professional after taking a few years off. And it obviously meant a lot to me. But I also did not want, so I really wanted to sing it, but I I, I wanted it to be such a celebration of the courage of getting out there um, instead of any sense of, oh, this poor woman, she didn't, you know, she did that. that. So, um, so we just had a lot of fun with it. I, Wendy and I, it, it, we must have worked on it for four months. You know, it's your first arrangement. So you're like going. And uh, it, it was just, um, it was just thrilling. It was a thrilling moment in the show. Um, Jerry Herman in my life. I mean, I'm a fan, people. I'm a fan. That's all I can offer you. I didn't work with Jerry. Um, I've sung a lot of his songs and auditions. I assisted, directed a high school production of Hello, Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as far as ever getting to have met the man or any, he, he did write one of my dream roles, um, which is Mame. I, I, fantasize about eventually getting to play that role. Um, but um, I think the thing that always attracted me to do Jerry's music in whatever way is because of the joy and the familiarity. I mean, the minute you start a Jerry Herman song, generally speaking, people relax. Mm -hmm. They just go, okay, let's hear this. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's a wonderful way to... Um, That's very calling now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jerry, right? <laughs> so anyway, so yes, so that's how, uh, that's how it made it onto the album. And can I mention something? You were talking about how Jerry would take a song and he would reimagine it. We have to talk because uh, interestingly, I did something on the album where I have a song that uh, Irving Berlin used in a movie that was actually originally in a Broadway show that was cut. 
Um, and so the reimagine is not me. The reimagine is literally Irving Berlin. Look what he did. They, you wouldn't even know they were the same song, but they are. They're identical melody. And also to two other points. One, all the all of the um, show doctor songs that he wrote. So many people don't know, but they're brilliant. And you know that's a whole other um, uh, avenue. Ooh. But but you were sort of alluding to something. Have you noticed that he wrote for women? Mm. His characters are all women. And that's why we can sing them. That's why we relate. And um, even the, so I think some of his strongest ca male characters were actually um, in Milk and Honey and in Hello, Dolly. But the rest of it, even Lacage, I mean, male, female, it, it was still sort of the same. And how he did it, I don't know. He would say he relied on source material. I always felt that his lyrics in particular are an x-ray of my soul. And even more interesting is in my teens and 20s, I obviously related to Mac and Mabel. And now as I'm older, wow, Mame and Hello Dolly, they, they take on a whole new importance and resonate with me in a way. So for me, Jerry's music is really a lifelong journey that I get to take with him. And um, it's, it's something pretty special. Yeah, he's, he's an understated genius. And I, I wanted to ask a question about this because I heard this a long time ago. I've never been able to confirm it, but it, it, from, a, from a, a structural point of view, it actually made incredible sense to me. Um, when he was writing Hello, Dolly, and he had the, ma the amazing Hello, Dolly, um, that he purposely wrote the character who plays Ribbons Down My Back to be much more of a musical voice because he needed, he wanted to have that in the show. He just didn't want, you know, it wasn't going to be Dolly that was doing it. It was going to be this character. Okay, so three things. My mother was his main singer, and she was a mezzo-soprano. So she always sang his music first. So I think when Jerry wrote, he basically wrote for a mezzo-soprano. And Hello, Dolly, obviously when Carol was singing, that was just not going to happen. <laughs> so the contrast was incredible. And then in Thornton Wilder's book, there's a reference to ribbons down my back. I think they needed the contrast because remember, Dolly is a farce. And each one of those characters are characters in, in their own way. So I think that um, when uh, Mrs. Malloy sings Ribbons Down My Back, I think that very much plays into it. And also, when shows were written back in the day, there were a lot of throwaway songs because they had to move the, the scenery. Yes, the right. So motherhood, I mean, oh. what that does for the show, moving the show along, it just literally moved the, um, the set. The set. <laughs> Oh, those are some of the things that you have to find as we sort of update things. Right? Interestingly enough about Dolly is that when Eileen oh. Brennan and uh, Charles Nelson Riley came into the show, because they were comedians, uh, they really went for the comedy aspect of it. And the interesting thing about them is that after them, uh, every other uh, Mrs. Malloy and every other Cornelius played it, for the most part, straighter than those two characters. It's true. It was never the same again after that. It's true. And also, I felt that Horace Vandegelder, you know, this song, A Penny in My Pocket, mm -hmm. okay, that was cut. And I, I'm i glad they put it back in, because I always, I always felt that Horace was demonized. And when you understood a little bit more about how he became the Yonkers' finest quarter millionaire, or half a millionaire, um, you, you really understood that. So there are some great songs and, you know, they're there for, for very good reasons. But I think, uh, Richard, you're right. Um, as things moved on, uh, you know, the, the well, performers were better singers and maybe a little less funny. Do you know how it was originally staged? When it was originally staged, it showed actually how he amassed all of his money. Uh, and it ended the first act. And of course, before the parade passes by, he replaced that. But when I heard that they were going to put the number back into the show, uh, I, I reimagined where it would go in the show. And I felt that it should have come into the show before the hatshot scene. 
because that would have given us a chance to get to know him before everything else that transpired after that. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought this too, yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, Come and Be My Butterfly, which was the song that was cut from the show, uh, Jerry said he regretted that song being cut the most. Ooh. Where was that in the show? It was a big number that was in the Harmonia Gardens instead of the polka contest. Oh, God. <laughs> the polka contest went into the show when Ginger Rogers came into the show, whose birthday is today, by the way. Oh, happy birthday. Aww. Yes. So uh, as you can see on the screen, I've got the word balance. Um, Carol Channing used to say that when Jerry stood in line, uh, she, he stood in line twice uh, he, because he did the lyrics and he also did the music. Uh, and he seemed to have this well-balanced life. And a lot of people don't know, of course, Jane and Harlan, you both know this, I'm sure. He was also a great architect. He did all this work outside the theater uh, and was a great designer. Uh, had all these great other skills. Um, and I think of balance, he seemed to have a well-balanced life. Uh, you know, I think, he, I think he did. And as a matter of fact, um, I always said, I think he's got restless real estate disease. <laughs> and it kind of got me involved in the real estate business because he, he was a graduate of Parsons and he really thought that he was going to design houses. And it was his mother who said, do me a favor. I have a friend of a friend of a friend. It was the mother mafia situation. And he, he saw Mr. Lester who opened up his songbook and he played a few things and he said, kid, he said, I really think you've got talent. Keep up with this. And were it not for Fred Lester, I'm not sure we would have had Jerry Herman. But he loved, he loved design and decoration. And actually that was really at, the most honest level that my daughter and Jerry connected because they both shared that, that love of art together. But he was wildly creative. And I would argue with Carol that it wasn't he stood in line twice. He just kept on standing in line and didn't know that he couldn't go back. back yeah. So many talents. <laughs> yes. so, um, I so, like that analogy. So well, you, you, saw, you, saw, you, saw, you saw his fingerprints on everything from Freddie's costumes to the yes. sets. To, oh, you, really? It was very clear that, that Jerry had something to do with all of that. And also lighting was his yeah. biggest issue because he said, if you can't see somebody, you can't hear somebody. And he looked at gels. I mean, color. And he taught me so much about what gels to use on what people and the images. And he would get up and change the... Um, uh, the, the gels, they probably don't use gels anymore. I'm not dating myself, but but you're right. It was, he did have his fingerprint on everything because I don't think Jerry saw things separately. I think he saw it in its entirety. And maybe that's the balance that you're talking about. There was Absolutely. nothing was deconstructed. It was complete. Yeah, he saw a whole picture. But yeah. no, go ahead. Uh, but I was going to say, you know, with the balance, though, and I really credit with this. You talk about optimism. When he was diagnosed with HIV, AIDS, you know, a lot of people would have thrown the covers over their head and say, that's it. I'm giving up. And he didn't. He kept on going. And, you know, he wrote Miss Spectacular. He wrote the theme song to Barney the Dinosaur for Sarah, which is amazing. Bernadette Peters um, performed it with like a 40 piece orchestra. I think they recorded in, in Canada, but he really never stopped writing. And he went on to do these, these tours, teaching young people about musical theater. He was a fighter. He didn't give up. One crazy story. And I do think he was born under a lucky star. I remember when HIV was just, beyond frightening and people were passing away left, right, and center. He was one of three people who was accepted to a program in San Francisco to get injected with monkey syrup. He's never missed a plane in his life. He missed the plane to San Francisco and somebody took his place. All three men died. Wow. I never knew that. He's just born under, and I'll tell you one other story and then I'll, they'll, we'll, no, we'll, no, go ahead. I love it. But we love to go in New York. We love to go to a fabulous Indian restaurant 
um, on East, I think it was 59th Street, called Gaylord's Restaurant. And they had the best psychic in the world. And this was in the very early 80s. And this Indian psychic went into a trance with Jerry. And he said, you're born under a lucky star. He said, you're going to have a disease, but it will not kill you. And I think about that to this day. So I just think it was written in the stars that he was just was put on this planet to give us all music and joy and a, and a perspective. So Harlan, I've got a question from one of our guests. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. okay. <laughs> the question is, please tell us about a funny event that happened in I'm sure There are so many uh, with the star of your choice, past or present. Oh, gosh, so many. Uh, there's the Kennedy Center, Jane. You and I have so many stories. Yes. Right? <laughs> I mean, you, you, want, you, you want to be treated well. Travel with Cheetah Rivera, Carol Channing, and Angela Lansbury and Jerry Herman. Um, I think, actually, for me, all my uh, since I got here and since I met Jerry and Carol and Angela, I have heard parade passes by, open a new window. Um, to take a, uh, it took a moment every I can't say at least a week doesn't go by. When Carol was alive, I heard them every day. But um, I think my favorite moment has got to be when I got a phone call from Bette Midler asking if she could meet Carol Channing. So, and going, driving down to Palm Springs, introducing her to Carol. And I wish, and my great regret is that I didn't, I took pictures, but I didn't think when they started singing Parade Passes By together, mm. what? was wrong with me that I didn't pick up my phone and film that moment. Oh my God. That's I think one of the greatest, seeing the past meet the present mm. in one moment and the love they were talking about Jerry at that moment, uh, talking about what Jerry intended, what, you know, what they were doing. And of course, Carol was telling him, make it your own. And it was, uh, J Jerry's spirit was there. I'll tell you uh, an interesting story. I went to, and I'm not going to mention the actress's name. I went to see a production of Dolly, and I've seen so many. Um, but I went to this production, and I called Carol during intermission. And she said, well, what do you think? And I said, she's not you. And Carol said, Richard, that's worse than racial profiling. <laughs> you know that thought right now. <laughs> Wait till the second act. That's when it comes alive. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. We're going to give away um, a CD right now. I'm going to bring uh, this on. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, this screen on. So bear with me a second. Your screen. Let's do this. Bear with me. Uh, and uh, giveaway tool. Share. Uh, there we are. Here we are. Yes. And then I go here. I hit balance, and we'll see who our winner is tonight. It's Aaron, who's a dear friend of mine. And Anne, I think you also said you had another bonus that you're giving away tonight. Yeah, well, because I, I gave away a CD last night, so I thought maybe uh, if someone's in New York and I could give them two tickets to um, my uh, Reimagine Live October 23rd. October 23rd, Aaron. Aaron at the yes. Laurie Beachman. So I'm going to end uh, tonight's show with another clip. Uh, I showed this clip last week when we celebrated uh, Don Pippen. Uh, and I thought uh, this would be uh, a great uh, closer tonight as well. Uh, one of his classic uh, arrangements of one of Jerry Herman's greatest songs. But before we do, uh, and I'm going to give my closing remarks. And then, Anne, I will let you have your closing remarks about Jerry, followed by Harlan. And Jane, I'm going to let you have the closing remarks tonight. Thank you. Uh, and what I'd like to say to everybody, uh, thank you, first of all, for being here tonight. You could have been anywhere else tonight. And the fact that you chose to spend it with us, none of us take it lightly. So thank you for being here. Uh, create balance in your life always. Uh, when life gets you down, uh, put on a Jerry Herman musical and dance around the house. Uh, put your eye, uh, ear pods on, dance out on the street. Uh, just listen to it as loud as you can. Uh, Carol, Jerry, uh, Angela, uh, all of them. 
Uh, his music is to uplift. And remember, uh, Encores is going to be doing uh, their uh, production of Dear World with Donna Murphy, who I saw as Dolly Levi, and I loved her. Wow. Uh, so uh, please, please, please. Uh, I did a little research today, and I found 40 productions of Hello, Dolly that are performing on stages tonight around the country. Uh, high schools uh, are still doing Dolly. Uh, MAME uh, hasn't been revived on Broadway since Angela Lansbury last did it. Uh, it's time to find a new generation to enjoy these shows. Uh, and I hope that Encores, if you're listening, uh, will consider uh, Ann Kittredge as MAME Dennis. She's ready. She's ready. <laughs> So I'm going to leave the screen, and Anne, it's yours, then Harlan, and then Jane, and thank you for being here. And Jane, when you come to New York, we're going to do that interview. Done. Okay. Thank you. Anne, it's all yours. Well, Richard does this all the time, but I do want to say how honored I have been to have sponsored this week of interviews. They were just amazing. I got to watch them all. I got to be a part of a couple of them. For this show, I'm just you know, gosh, I am so um, grateful to have been included. And um, I wish all you Jerry Herman fans out there, and if you're not, or you don't know about him to become one and um, just have a great life, everybody with German. Jerry Herman is your background music. Bye. <laughs> I guess that's me. Um, I just uh, just want to tell people that uh, Dolly is continuing on and on and on. Most of my clients, Joanne Worley, Carol Cook, Judy Norton, all of them. And now coming up is Tony Tennille. She's, uh, she said it was on her bucket list. She's, list. She's coming out of retirement to do uh, hello to, to Dolly in Arizona. And if you want a real treat, you can go to my YouTube. And there's a moment I picked up my camera and filmed it that at the Kennedy Centers with Angela Carroll and Cheetah rehearsing backstage. If you ever want to have just some fun, you can see the love they have for this, this master that they worked with, if you ever want to watch it. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you all for tuning in and sharing our love for a wonderful man. And Jane, I love you with all my heart. Oh, I love you. You're my soul brother. Yeah. And Richard, I would love to thank you for just keeping musical theater alive in such an intelligent way um, and doing a deeper dive into artists that we all love and yearn to learn more about. So in my final comments, I'd like to use Jerry's lyrics because honestly, nobody does it better. So for me, no other music has such majesty. And from Milk and Honey, let's not waste a moment, let's not lose a day. There's a short tomorrow, so for God's sakes, listen to Jerry Herman music. Thank you, Richard. Please welcome the original conductor of MAME, Don Pippin. And Ron Rains. You coax the blues right out of the horn. Maybe you charm the husks right off of the corn. Strumming and plunking out of tune to beat the band. The whole plantation's humming since you brought Dixie back to Dixieland. You make the cotton easy to pick. May you give my old men julep a kick. Yeah. 
bells to shame You made us feel alive again You given us the drive again to make the South revive again. Made. You brought the cakewalk back into style. Made. You make the weeping willow tree smile. Made. Your skin is Dixie sad. There's a rebel in your manner and your speech You may be from Manhattan But Georgia never had a sweeter peach You make the old magnolia tree bud You make the meals boom in the Robert E. Lee must have The strumming and rigging, the humming and singing is starting to get out of 